Hello everyone and welcome back to Unreal Tips and Tricks. Today I want to show you how to use splines and instanced static mesh components to make useful and performant tools to quickly lay out repetitive geometry. We'll look at two ways you can use these two components in a blueprint to quickly place and edit a lot of geometry in the world. In both cases, we'll be banking a blueprint that places copies of a mesh along the user editable spline. We'll expose a few parameters for our users, determine the spacing between copies using the mesh itself, then use that information to determine where to place the copies along the spline. Then I'll show you how you can use that information to make sure your copies follow the spline. Let's dive in. I'm here in our advanced vehicle template that comes with the Unreal Engine, and let's say I want to add some barriers around the racetrack. I'll start with the stack of tires I modeled using Unreal's built-in tools and textured with materials from Quixel. I want to add these to most of the corners and turns on the track so that my car doesn't go flying off. And there's a lot of twists and turns on this course. Instead of dragging and duplicating them all throughout the map, I'll show you how we can use splines and instant static mesh components to really quickly place a bunch of these tire stacks exactly where we want them. In the content browser, I'll right click and say create basic asset blueprint class and set the parent class of the blueprint to actor. I'll name that BP Spline Layout Tool and open it up. In the Blueprint Editor window, I'll click the Add Component button and type Spline. I don't want to use a spline mesh because I don't want my meshes to deform along the spline. We want them to stay rigid. This gives me a line and I can click on its points to drag it around. I can Alt click and drag to add points and I can change the tangents of it to customize the shape. In many cases, you might have a function in your construction script that adds static mesh components to the blueprint. However, this comes with some performance issues both in rendering and in the construction script. Since I know I'm using a single static mesh, I can instead use an instanced static mesh component. It basically says, take the static mesh I've specified and stamp it around in a bunch of different places. I'll hit add components again and type instanced static mesh and click it to add that component. Since I'm making a tool for other users in my project, I want to expose a few variables to them. So when they're placing this blueprint in the world, it'll be easy to modify. The first variable I want to expose is the static mesh we'll be placing along the spline. I'll bring my instanced static mesh component into the construction script, which will create a git node, and I'll drag off that and type set static mesh and select that function. I'll connect the execution pin of that node to the start of my construction script. Then I can right click on the new mesh pin on that node and say promote to variable, which will automatically create a new variable of the type static mesh. I'll rename that to placed mesh and click the eye icon next to it to set it to be instance editable. So anyone placing this blueprint can change this value when the blueprint is placed in the world. I'll set the default of this variable to my stack of tires asset. We know we want to space these meshes a certain distance apart from each other. So instead of relying on a user-specified float variable, we can use the mesh itself to get the spacing we need. I'll create a getter for my placed mesh variable in the construction script. And from that, I'll type git bounding box. And from that, break structure, then subtract the min value from the max value to get the size of our mesh. Next, from that vector, I'll create a break vector node and I'll use the size of the geo along the x-axis since that's a common forward axis. This will become more useful later. This means we'll stack the tires right on top of each other as we place them along the spline, but I want my users to be able to control the spacing ever so slightly. So for that, I'll add an offset to this number. In the My Blueprint panel, I'll click the plus icon next to the variables category to make a new variable, which I'll name offset. I'll promote this one to instance editable, and I'll change its type to float. From the X output of the break vector, I'll create a float plus float node and connect our offset variable to it. This lets me offset it forward or backward along the spline. So if I want to be able to offset further, I can just type positive values, or if I want them closer, I can use negative values. I'll recompile my blueprint and set that default offset to eh, five or so. I'll right click on that offset plus X size output pin and select promote to variable. And I'll call this variable spacing. I don't want to make this instance editable though, since we're automatically calculating it. Next, we need to figure out the number of instances we're going to place along this spline. First, I'll bring the spline from the components panel into my graph and from that say get spline length. From there, I'll create a float divided by float node and divide the length of the spline by our spacing value. 
this will give me a float number with some sort of remainder or decimal because we're not always going to have a spline with the perfect size. I'll need to convert this to a whole number, and to do this, I can either seal it or floor it. If I seal it, it'll round up to the nearest whole number, or if I floor it, it will round down to the nearest integer. Because I don't want to place meshes past the end of the spline, I want to round down. I can drag off the division and type floor, and I'll right-click on the output of the floor node and select Promote to Local Variable, and I'll name this number of instances, and connect that to my earlier nodes. From here, I'll make a for loop and use my number of instances variable for the last index. I'll take the index output of the for loop and multiply that by spacing. This will be how far along the spline we should place our mesh, or the total length of meshes we've placed along the spline so far. I can once again drag off my spline component and type git location at distance along spline which will give me a local space location for a point that is a given distance from the start of the spline. From the get location at distance along spline output, I'll create a make transform node. We'll leave the rotation and scale set to their defaults for now. So this is now a transform in local space for the current instance. Next, I'll bring the instanced static mesh component into the graph. From it, create an add instance node. This tells the component to stamp this mesh at this transform. I'll connect my make transform node to the transform input of the add instance node, and we'll see what happened in the blueprint viewport. Hey, that looks great. When I place my blueprint in the world, I can click on the spline and drag it around to get my row of tire stacks to fit around the curve of this track. This technique works great when you have a mesh with a roughly square footprint that you want to place at regular intervals. There's so much you can do with this, and I encourage you to explore the possibilities. I'll show you one more thing you can do with your spline layout tool, though. If I swap my stack of tires for this concrete barrier that I got from Quixel Megascans, you'll see that our instances don't follow the curve of the spline anymore. That was less of an issue for our stack of tires, but becomes really apparent with a more directional mesh like this. We need to get these concrete barriers pointing toward each other. To do this, I'm going to get the location of the next instance, and use that information to create a rotation value that we can pass into our make transform node. I don't want to simply copy and paste this bit of functionality here because I'm the kind of person who doesn't like to do the same thing twice. Instead, let's wrap this up in a function. And the My Blueprints panel, I'll click the plus icon next to the functions to create a new function and name it get location at index. I'll select all these nodes from my for loop to my get location at distance along spline node right-click and select Cut. Then I open that get location at index function, press Control v to paste. Now you can see that the integer input into our multiply function is empty. We can click and drag on that over to the function node to create a new input variable. Similarly, I can drag the location output of my get location at distance along spline node onto that same function start node to create a vector return value. I'll connect my get location at distance along spline output to that return value and make sure that the start of my function is connected to the return node here. Now, if I go back into the construction script, I can place my get location at index function into the graph and connect that into my loop body. I can connect my index to the A input and the return value to my make transform node. However, I'm going to need a second one of these and I'm starting to feel a little cramped in the graph like my blueprint is getting clogged up. Since our get location and index function doesn't change anything about the blueprint or call any other functions, we can make this a pure function, which means it won't have any execution pins. I'll select the function in the My Blueprint panel and select the pure checkbox. You can see it changed to a green icon, and in the construction script, you can see that it doesn't have any execution pins anymore. I can right-click on that node and select Duplicate. And for the input of this function, I'll add one to the index from our for loop. I'm going to pause here since you may think we're about to run into trouble if we pass in an index that is greater than the number of meshes that we want to place, and thus finding a distance along the spline that is beyond the actual length of the spline. The good news for our purposes is that the get location at distance along spline function will return the end point of the spline if the distance is longer than the spline itself. So for the last point we need to calculate our rotation, we'll always get the end of our spline. So now I have my location of the current instance and the location of the next instance, or the end of my spline, 
we'll need to make a vector that points from the current location to the next location and use that to make a rotation. And to do that, all we have to do is subtract the location of the current instance from the location of the next instance. From there, we'll create a make rot from x node. This takes that vector as an input and makes a rotation value with that vector as the quote unquote forward vector. We can connect the rotation output of that node to the rotation input of our make transform node. In the blueprint viewport, we can see nothing has changed, which again is what we want to see. In the level editor though, we can see now that the concrete barriers are properly aligned and pointing toward each other. And you can see as I move the spline around and add points to it, we're making more barriers and they're all connecting up. And that's it. Now we've got this really useful and reusable instance layout utility that can work in all sorts of directions, elevations, distances, and angles. If I ever want to change this racetrack, it won't take me that long to put down new splines to adapt to its shape. There's so much you can do with these concepts. You could use this to make fences, place street lamps along a road, or trees along a trail. You could even use this to make chains. You could add functionality to jitter the offset, or push the instances side to side. You could randomize the rotations of meshes within a certain range, add controls to select which axis to use for the sides of the mesh. This is just the beginning. I hope you have fun exploring all of the possibilities with this tool. Thanks for watching.